I'm here with uh, Joe Petrelli. Well, I'm really glad I'm here. What was it that you wanted to get from the conference, and uh, what is it like the key message that you want to send to people? Derek Evans from uh, AFBI, Agrofood and Biosciences Institute. Okay, uh, so I am Jack Wooden. I work with the Fourth Rivers Trust and I am uh, one of the freshwater ecologists. Scottish Hill Conference. <laughs> and uh, a few little bits that I wanted to uh, cover first, just to really set the scene for freshwater conservation and uh, really just say the, the state of affairs as, as we currently sit. So 1% of the globe, 1% um, of the earth is covered by flowing freshwater, or actually less than 1%. Um, and yet 51% of all the species that we know within science exist within this, within this, this framework, within freshwater, which is truly incredible. And yet 30% of all species known within freshwater have become extinct. It's not that they're at risk, it's not that they're potentially slipping in a downward trend, they are completely extinct. And there was 80 of those that were lost in 2020. This isn't a, 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 an old industrial um, time where we, we lost all this and now we're, we're really getting back on our feet. 80 were lost. And these are significant species. This is species like the paddlefish. Uh, huge, amazing, incredible species that people know and love and part of cultures, part of tra uh, traditions, and yet they are still going extinct. Uh, we've got an over 30% loss of wetland habitat and that is increasing rather than decreasing, and that is in just the last 50 years. So, what about the eel? The eel isn't particularly in a great way, to be honest, but um, there is hope that people are doing some amazing things, and you'll hear some amazing talks today about what we are doing. Um, the eel, since the 1980s, has had a huge decline of upwards of 90%. Depending on where you are in Europe, that was said to be up to 99% as well. This is an incredible, monumental crash in a species. And this, we don't fully understand still. We're not 100% sure why this happened. We don't really understand the mechanics of why this huge decrease occurred in a relatively short uh, framework, as up, uh, frame of time. But what we do know is the things that are hindering them still. What we do know is that river barriers, that pollution, that illegal fishing, that 101 of the uh, causes that everyone will cover today are still impacting them today and this is really what we want to be working on and this is what we want to be pushing rather than looking back in history and saying what caused this what can we do now i'll run through the life cycle very very quickly just for people who aren't too familiar with it i know there'll be a lot of people here who know this very very well um so we're going to start in the sargasso sea up at the top here we've got eggs that are floating in this uh, lovely sort of uh, planktonic soup in the, in the top layer of the ocean. And these hatch out very, very quickly, actually, a uh, matter of days into this sort of pre-larval stage. And then as they, um, as they transform over the next um, days, weeks, months, they turn to a willow-shaped leaf uh, fish. This is, uh, uh, this is adapted so it will drift on oceanic currents back uh, or drift on oceanic currents to Europe. As it does this, is this uh, translucent form, it arrives at our coastline, it arrives at the continental shelf of Europe, and it has changed and transformed into what we know as the glass eel. The glass eel is an unpigmented form of the eel. It's a bit more recognisable as the eel, though you can see the shape, it's a bit more eel-like, and as it ebbs and flows on the tides back into, into our freshwater back out to sea over a matter of months. This gains pigment as an elder and moves into the freshwater system. This pushes up into our rivers and lives in its longest life stage as the yellow eel. The yellow eel can be, de uh, this life stage can, can be decades long. And this is usually what we see when we see eels within our rivers, uh, lakes, lochs. And this stage, this silver eel stage, is the 
time in which your anneal is starting to mature. It isn't fully mature yet, but it's starting the process. It has an incredible metallic silver belly, a really dark back, its eyes grow and enlarge, its pectoral fins grow, its digestive tract changes, and its sexual organs start to develop. And this is the stage in which it goes out to sea and makes this journey back to the Sargasso Sea, a 4,000 mile journey to the Sargasso Sea, and it then spawns there and dies. And we still don't fully understand the exact location of this and a lot of the mechanisms which control this as well. A truly incredible life cycle. Uh, a few things I wanted to touch on just to emphasize how incredible this species is, is the fact that it used to be used as currency. This you could pay your rent in, you could pay your taxes in. And in the Doomsday book, we have this incredible log of what they actually paid for in eel. Truly exceptional. Uh, the historic mystery of this species, there's been all sorts of amazing, incredible people from Aristotle thousands of years ago who have tried to figure out everything about eel. And we still don't know everything that there is to know. We're still finding out all of the new, uh, new information year on uh, year. On year. Um, and we still don't know what controls a lot of their life cycle. Uh, sustenance, we know that early man, um, nomadic man, moving around the, uh, around the world, tracked the eels and moved with their migration of silver eels leaving in the winter and glass eels and elvers pushing into our rivers. We know this because in the, uh, in the ancient um, remains of these, of these uh, traveling camps, of these towns that were set up, there was the bones of eels. And this was a, a level of sustenance for people who moved from a very, very early time of man all the way up to current day. This is still something that large parts of Europe, uh, France, Italy, Netherlands, Spain, all still have a culture of eel. We seem to have lost it a little bit in the UK, though. Um, wildlife health, what do eels do? So this huge influx of nutrients from the sea is carried up into our freshwater ecosystems and deposited. And this helps everything from the riparian zone, um, the trees and the um, flora um, on our, uh, actually outside of the water, helps bees grow and gain the nutrients they need. And it also works in the ecosystem that they're directly linked to, the aquatic one. This is everything from aquatic mammals to birds, other fish species. Uh, they all feed on different life stages of the eel. They are integral to our ecosystems. And this isn't just a European eel, this is across the world. Uh, putting places on the map, everyone's heard of Ely. Um, there's, there's these places across the world, not just in the UK, not just in Europe, but across the world that have been named after the eels, which were significant parts of their culture, of their, um, of their identity. So, uh, Scotland eel, so the eel management plant in Scotland. Um, we have these eel management plans, which were created by the European Commission. And each member state has an eel management plan. How are they going to manage their eels? And essentially, this means that they can tailor it to what they need within their environment to protect the eel. Uh, within the Scottish one, uh, we look for establishing or achieving 40% escapement. This is based on a pristine population or a pre-1980s population. So when populations were healthy, this is trying to, um, this is trying to make sure that at least 40% escape. Uh, the closure of all fisheries, including recreational fishing, fishing actually in Scotland, that's uh, practiced. And uh, we want to uh, establish what the recruitment is. So what these young eels coming into our freshwater environments, what level is that? The standing stock, the yellow eels that live here for decades, we want to understand this. We want to understand what's going out to sea as well. So essentially what comes in, what stays, and then what goes back out and spawns again. And um, these are reports which are every three years, and the eel management plan uh, is managed by Marine Scotland. All sounds uh, very ambitious, um, but considering we have no idea what 40% of escapement is, we have no idea how to establish this, we have no idea what comes in, what stays, what goes out. How are we supposed to manage a species which we don't know, or we, have, we don't have a, co a nice collective data of Scotland? And a lot of places don't have a complete data, uh, data set. Uh, the closure of fisheries, there was very, very few fisheries actually open at the time, and there was a few small-time players, and without fishing as well, we're not able to establish any sort of data or framework or understanding of the species that they are taking out. So essentially what it meant is we closed a few small-time players, and we have now no understanding of the, um, of the eel in Scotland. And we base all of our data off other areas of the world that are comparable to us in habitat.
which I think truly is not good enough for protecting a critically endangered species. Uh, so, talking about the data though, we do have a great collection of data actually within fisheries trusts and rivers trusts. And this is a collection all across Scotland of where eels have been seen in different surveys for different fish usually, and where they've been included. So just this map alone highlights the true extent of what the potential we, we could learn from what we already have. And yet it isn't stored, it, it's, it isn't utilized in the way that we really need it to be. The data is collected in a way that we can't particularly use it as well. We've got some count data in there, but we don't know the life stages or certain elements have been missed out. So we need to hone our ability to collect this data in a more efficient manner. Uh, so I've touched on some of the issues facing eel, and we're gonna focus mainly on river barriers. Uh, in this presentation, other people are speaking about a whole plethora of different uh, issues. But these are all issues that many people will see are shared by many, many species. Uh, everything from pollution, habitat loss, uh, loss, the river barriers, introduced diseases, um, over or illegal fishing, and of course, climate change. All these things affect the eel. So what essentially have we been doing to tackle any of these? What is it, what is it that we can do as a collective as well? So the Forgotten Fish Project as part of the Fourth Rivers Trust was set up to focus on species which are either less loved or they are not usually focused on within conservation. And I think this is definitely something that we can say that eel is. Uh, we worked on this general principle of monitoring field work, which is direct conservation, getting in and actually doing something rather than learning about it, establishing all these great, amazing, incredible bits of data and then doing nothing with it. This is the hands-on conservation. And then, of course, we need the education to work alongside this to have any sort of proper conservation benefit. So, our direct conservation. Uh, as I said, we're going to focus on the river barrier easement. When I talk about river barriers, what I mean is weirs, dams, sluice gates, uh, sluice gates, things that block rivers up, things that stop the natural flow of the river and also the natural migration of species up or down these river systems. So, uh, river barriers, heritage or hindrance? Um, well, I wouldn't say any of this is, is heritage. Heritage is incredibly important and we need to protect it, but we also need to be flexible. Half of the time we are trying to remove barriers, which is what we should always focus on trying to do, get these barriers out, but we're, we're constantly coming up against is, is a heritage spot. Heritage, heritage is trumps everything. everything. Heritage is what we need to protect in this area. And a lot of these areas are, well, none of these are particularly attractive. No one really knows what this weir was for. The local community isn't engaged. Nobody has any want or need for this anymore. That isn't the case in all uh, weirs, dams, sluice gates. That isn't the case in all of them. But a lot of them, a significant amount of them, we would be able to remove with a bit more leniency. And we are constantly coming up against these issues. So essentially, what can we do? Um, when we're working with smaller barriers, it's a little bit easier to remove them. But then we're coming up against um, green energy, uh, hydro schemes, and these schemes are extraordinarily expensive once they are in. So you can see why people aren't going to want to remove these. We've got a wonderful speaker, uh, Mike from Woosh, and he's gonna introduce the, the, essentially what we need to do in these situations where barriers can't be removed and the technology that we can use to do this as well. Um, but your smaller ways are a lot more easier to tackle than these big ones. So uh, what happens when we come up to a river barrier? We can do a few things, we can remove it, which is, should always be the case. We should take them out whenever we can. But there is ones that are structural, there are ones that are so highly graded within heritage that it is impossible to touch it ever. Um, even whisper about touching the, the weir is too much. And what we need to do is we need to find a solution, and the solution usually comes down to fish passes. Uh, fish passes come in all shapes and sizes, and um, the majority of them, we are, we're talking about technical fish passes. So your, um, your Alaskan fish passes, your Lorinier uh, fish passes, for people who don't know what these are, they're essentially these mad little solutions that you can get fish from below to above away using usually either a set of 
uh, steps that fish can leap into or a set of wetted areas that they can migrate through. And we've got old historic ones like these box passes here, which are awful. It's just a washing machine for fish. And they jump into each one, get tumbled around, jump into the next one. And thankfully, we've moved away from this and to um, slightly better ways of doing things now um, and slightly more fish friendly ways of doing it. But um, I truly believe in 10 years, we will be looking at very, very different fish passes from what we create nowadays, because a lot of these are static, a lot of them um, they mean that you have to be a certain type of fish to get through. It means that you have to have a certain swimming speed. It has to be um, a certain size. All of these are very, very specific and usually focused on salmon or salmonids. A lot of the um, a lot of the fish passes that we've worked on the fish, fish project, project trying to um, get eels above a weir, a dam, a sluice gate is retrofitting onto existing fish passes, which is an unbelievable waste of money when a fish pass has been built and we have the opportunity to get eels from A to B or from below to above and we don't take that chance because we're looking at a singular species. It should be an ecosystem approach. Uh, we've got also some amazing fish passes like rock ramps and uh, these are essentially your more naturalised areas. So we're trying to turn it a bit more natural while keeping the existing structure in there and we'll learn a lot more about different fish passes from my later on. So some of the bits that I've gone into with the Forgotten Fish Project is trying to make, um, make passes a little bit cheaper, a little bit more affordable and tackle the 1.2 million barriers we have in Europe by making it a lot more accessible for people. A lot of the time, it's not just heritage, it's not just the stringent uh, protection that these barriers have. It is the, the fact, fact that money is a, uh, an issue. Um, the monetary element comes into it very, very quickly when you start talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds, you know, potentially, um, or even just a couple of thousand pounds for 50 small whales across the river, it all starts to build up. So the Forgotten Fish Project created some solutions for this. Uh, this actually is um, the Loch Ness Fisherman's Cooperative Society. Uh, so this is some of the guys there making a straw eel rope. And what this is, essentially, you can see them making it here, is a long sausage shaped uh, bundle of straw that you drape over the top of a river, river barrier. And uh, you line this over the top, two or three next to each other and it creates a climbing structure a framework that eels can work their way through a wetted surface that allows them to cling onto onto a purchase area and work their way up and over a barrier and this is what pence maybe a pound a couple of pound and this is a solution which you can use to engage all of local communities people who want to do direct conservation and this isn't small time. The guys at Loch Ness Fisherman's Cooperative, um, these guys are, this is a big time fishery, and yet they use this and they practice this and they make these every single year. I had the pleasure of going over there and working with them for my masters, but also going back over and learning this technique. And I brought this over so that we can practice it in different areas, in small ways or small barriers on rivers, and it allows eels to get past. And this is usually what we do when we're adding it to um, an existing fish pass or even um, a, a barrier that uh, doesn't have any fish passage on it. Very, very cheap. We might have to wait until these guys finish. Um, but essentially, those guys are uh, fusing this into a bit more of a solid structure as they go. And then you have the whatever length you've made and you can put it straight on. These are some more of the methods that uh, we've used. So we've got coyote matting here. This is lining an existing fish pass. I've never seen water move so quickly as in this chute here, which was, it was used to essentially as an eel pass to allow eels from below the way to above it. And the swimming speed that would need, be needed in there was far over the ability of a fully grown adult salmon. And yet this was the eel pass that was provided. It was completely impossible, completely impassable. And what we did, we just stuffed it with Matting. Really, really simple, extremely, extremely cheap. And within the first few weeks, we went back and it had turned into almost a swamp area. It was absolutely incredible. It was frogs, it was toads, it was fish living underneath it. A really incredible, very, very cheap solution as well. Uh, this is coir matting with 
Muscle spat rope in the middle, so if you're looking for something a bit more robust, muscle spat ropes are essentially these plastic um, anchored points that they have uh, in coastal areas to grow muscles on. It's got a buoy that floats at the top and the muscles insist onto it and then grow onto these ropes. They're extremely hardy because they need to be in a marine environment. They need to be knocked back into with the tide on a daily basis. And these things will go nowhere. We all know that plastic is a massive problem because it just won't degrade. But in some cases, it's really, really useful. And this is a structure that just won't go. So if you're looking for something a bit more robust, you've got other options. And you've also got the straw rope down practice. And I promise you, there is a needle in there somewhere. Um, there's a little bit of it there, uh, but you probably have to take my word for that. Uh, so these are some of the solutions that we've created, super cheap ones, just to get people engaged in it. And then there is no excuse not to fix a barrier. They are cheap and effective. It doesn't work for all big hydro schemes. It isn't possible. Large weirs, it gets more and more difficult to add these to. But this, there we go. Um, <clears throat> this wasn't a perfect solution, but I had 200 pounds to fix a weir. This is a, a large weir that has a hydro scheme on it and is abstracting by a, an Archimedes screw on where essentially where this camera has its back to. And uh, I got called because there was tens of thousands of eels sat in this basin just at the bottom there, and they'd been there for a couple of weeks as well. So essentially went, put one of these big sausages around the side of it, put it in, the same night was eels moving through. And it was only because this clean concrete lip they put on, they had reformed it and re, and slightly higher to the height of the weir to hold more water back for the hydro scheme and it was so smooth and the, the people there did such a good job at finishing this this concrete that the eels had no purchase so they couldn't climb up the side of it and if they just left it a bit rougher then it would have been probably ideal for them but we put this in cost let's say, a couple of hundred pounds lined it muscle spat rope in the middle and it worked uh, this is done glass. Uh, this was a small coastal burn, and you can see the weir in the background. And we created this odd little wooden structure. This isn't in full flow, but this is um, essentially a stepped, um, a stepped fish pass. Really, really cheap to create, and it allowed all species to get through. And again, a cheap solution. It won't last forever, but it's something until we can get that weir out. Monitoring. So these are some different styles of traps. You've got a pipe trap on the left, which is the ebbing and flowing of uh, eels on the tide. You can catch them in this funnel shaped uh, trap. On the right hand side, the Cedric trap or the mop trap. This is a refuge area that eels can sit within. And you can usually use barriers. The one good use for barriers, the one good use for weirs in our rivers is that it holds fish up and it gives you the opportunity to count them. And we did a cool project where we looked at the decreasing number of eels going through a river by monitoring them at each barrier using these different traps. And you can see them out there, um, all the traps that I'm talking about today. And what we were looking for essentially was to build an idea of which rivers were important to us, which rivers were, were where we should focus our conservation efforts. We were able to get length data, weight, general count, look at the actual quality of the eels coming in. And this gives us a better understanding. It's not a, a, a full overview. It's not going to give you a fully quantitative measure but it gives you a few tools which are cheap to use, repeatable, and everyone can afford. And this is essentially what we're trying to achieve, a bit more, um, a bit more of a, a, an easy approach to eel conservation. This, I'm aware I'm running a bit low on time, and this is a, a rather long video. This is essentially how we check the traps. This Cedric mat, or this mop trap, um, I had hair then. Um, it was a stressful job working with eels. Um, but essentially, um, we take the trap out, the water drains out of it, the fibres constrict, trap the eel within, you can then put it into a bucket, you can put it into a net, and open up the fibres and all the eels drop straight out. You can then do a count. Very, very cheap, very, very efficient. And you can see I'm next to a weir here, and uh, I'm using that to trap and stop eels. And this enables us to have a, a great count of what's going in, and also gives you the opportunity to look at timing as well. When are these eels coming into our river systems? Uh, when is it important to get out there and monitor things? When is it important to look for illegal activity as well, which Andrew will talk about a lot later. Um, but essentially, I can hurry up a little bit. Uh, there we go, we've got some glass eels swimming around. Um, and this is a super cheap and efficient method that everyone can use in a repeatable way. Education. Well, we're doing this event. 
Uh, we've done a number of things throughout the project as well, all sorts of engagement, and we have got an incredible amount of resources from explaining the illegal trade, which I said we'll hear about later in a lot more depth, the eels and ladders game, which is the one thing I'll be remembered for, and this is essentially snakes and ladders ripped off for reels. But really, really cool. And this was over the time when everyone was trapped in and we were all um, isolating at home. And this was just things that we wanted people to be able to do at home and just engage with as well. And then also the life cycle. We have a number of different uh, resources on our website, on the Fourth Rivers Trust website. And the training and workshops. So we train people how to do all of these different methods, make these different methods, utilize them, use them, get them in there and getting some hands-on direct conservation, getting people out there and protecting the eel working for the eel and understanding it a little bit better within their organizations. And that is me. Thank you. <laughs>